Hey there, welcome to Write More Light. My name is Sarah Elgati and, and today we are going to talk about symbolism in literature. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I got really, really excited and inspired uh, like a week ago um, by this one quote I read of Stephen King's, which I read without context, I, I will confess. Um, but he said, symbolism exists to adorn and enrich not to create an artificial sense of profundity. And I think that um, that's super, super, super important when thinking about symbolism. I know that, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to post this quote in the chat. Uh, I think that's super, super important to, to keep in mind because we often uh, go about reading and writing thinking that Symbolism is is a thing that gives us depth, um, and we want to look deep. And while symbolism should absolutely, well, symbolism should absolutely add depth to your story, it should not be. A, a you should not be faking being profound. Um, trying to be profound, in my opinion, is the thing that will will break you. You're not. You're gonna fail every time you try. Um, so I started really thinking about symbolism and how I would write it. Uh, obviously, symbolism is does a lot, a lot, a lot of heavy lifting in poetry, but we also see it a ton in every other kind of writing. Um, and in real life, you know? Um, in real life, it's different, right? Like, there might be something that you know, triggers specific memories for me that make no sense to anyone else, like, I don't know, mason jars, my uh, aunt's kitchen, all she has is you know, mason jars with handles, you know, for cups. So I'm gonna go to this nostalgic place when I see them, but if I put a mason jar in my story, it's not gonna make sense to anybody except that there are mason jars that are being used for glasses, which is a thing that lots of people do. So that kind of symbolism absolutely will not work in in literature um, because your your reader needs context. Um, I want to give a few good examples, a few bad examples, and talk about intertextuality because that's where I really uh, get excited about this topic is intertextuality <clears throat> because once we begin writing. We're in a conversation with all, first all literature that we've read, but also all literature that came before us, whether we've read it or not. I occasionally talk about apples as symbolism, whether or not you, I talked about this in the metaphor video last week, um, whether or not you intend to have a bowl of fruit, and it's just fruit, and the cigar is just a cigar, once you have an apple in your story, you are now interacting the Bible, and you are now interacting with Snow White. Snow White, I suppose, is also interacting with the Bible. Um, and so you need to be aware of, you know, the, the big obvious symbols that we see all the time, such as apples or red roses. Um, and, and roses, too, are something that cross over into real life, where you know, we were all told at some point that <laughs> the all the rose colors have specific meanings, right? Red is love. Um, <clears throat> and so there's lots of examples of that out in the world. And those are really, really easy symbols to adapt to. You know, if there's something that the whole world has accepted, this is the meaning of this, even if it's a symbolic meaning, then dope. Use the crap out of it. Um, something I know that we all saw a lot of in high school was colors as symbolism. And I can tell you right now, I have no clue what the green light meant in the in the Great Gatsby, um, but I do get a real serious kick out of yellow wallpaper for the color yellow. The color yellow I've seen um, explored widely as for a symbolic value, and I think it's really interesting because it's it's one of those things that people have really strong feelings about, and they're totally polar opposites. Um, in psychology, and this is why I get a really big kick out of the color, uh, the color yellow, the yellow wallpaper. 
Uh, and that is, I took a psych class before I read it in which we talked about the psychology of colors and the color yellow is a mood intensifier. So the people who, who think that yellow is the happiest freaking thing in the world, um, they're not wrong. And then, you know, in the yellow wallpaper, which, um, Gilman probably didn't have access to this knowledge. So it's shenanigans, but it works really well that this person is uh, slowly going insane or whatever. Obviously there's a lot to unpack with yellow wallpaper. Uh, I am not your high school English teacher, so I won't go through it with you. Um, but if yellow is a mood intensifier and you walk into this room feeling crazy and then it gets worse, that's so great. That's just rife with things to unpack, which, um, Gilman doesn't need my help with. <laughs> she, uh, she did it. It's done. She did great. <clears throat> now, um, I'll talk about great symbolism in a minute, but one of my favorite, favorite things to talk about, and in fact, um, before starting this video, I went on a rant to my spouse about um, why I love this example of bad symbolism. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne is an abuser of symbolism, and I say that with love. I don't know that I enjoy reading Hawthorne, but I do love Hawthorne for just being the most overwrought person in American literature. Just, dude never saw a symbol he didn't like. <laughs> uh, and also, I suspect, did not trust his readers. My, my prime example is his short story, Young Goodman Brown. Uh, dude trusted his readers so little that he named his character Good Man and referred to him by his age throughout. Now, um, the story itself is about he, like dis the character discovers a like a Satanist cult in the woods and um, has to deal with cats. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and I love that all of Hawthorne's work is just overwhelmingly full of overt symbols and and I have to say that's too much you need to trust your audience you need to trust your audience to understand what you're saying um it's not it's not gonna it's not gonna feel natural it's gonna be annoying and silly to read if if you pull a hawthorne on it um he does he does a lot of that of course in um in his other work but that's my favorite reference point because um because the title of the story is this guy's name and he he doesn't even get a name his name is not john goodman his name's not john goodman brown he's not good man john brown he also wears brown i believe it's too much it's too much um so I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you to go out on a limb and trust your audience just a little bit more than Hawthorne did. Um, I don't I, I want I want to reiterate I don't hate Hawthorne, but I I, I really think Homie's got a symbolism problem. <laughs> uh, similarly, uh, Edgar Allan Poe did not trust his audience, and he was on record saying it a lot. So I don't know how full of symbolism. He was so much as he really liked to make everything creepy, but he overtly said he didn't trust his audience, and uh, which was his defense for writing short stories. He said that his he said that his readers don't have the attention span for a novel. With that in mind, um, Poe's stuff is also in your face and overwrought. There's no reading the Raven and wondering what it's about. And for me, I want, not always, not always, but I want more of a challenge than that. Uh, we, I, I talk about this a lot. I don't think there's anything wrong. I think there's something really beautiful about reading for entertainment and about writing for entertainment and escapism. So things like that, uh, I obviously don't need them to be deep. Although, you know, they can be fun, easy, and deep. That's a real thing. That exists. 
um, <clears throat> but I don't need them to be deep. But if you're going to use symbolism, <laughs> I see she twin <laughs> commenting. Uh, I think that was crap. I think that um, I think that Poe was being super rude in saying that his uh, his readers didn't have the attention span for novels. And maybe it was a joke or uh, or an excuse because he didn't have the attention span to write novels. Um, but that's it's garbage. <laughs> it's not real. Novels existed then and they exist now. Um, and we read them and they are read more than short stories. So take that for, for whatever it, for whatever you can. Um, okay, where was I? Uh, if yeah, if you're gonna use symbols, you need to you need to trust your your audience that they're going to understand them. Um, back to the mason jar thing, I actually have an example I use a lot when um, when talking about how symbolism can get difficult, which is um, dream interpretation is kind of a pet peeve of mine because I think that it's so specific to to the dreamer. Um, and an example that we see constantly, all the time, is that um, a dog, no matter what, in, in literature, in dreams, whatever, a dog is a sign of friendship, of loyalty, of protection. But if you have a dream about a dog, and you're afraid of dogs, the dog probably doesn't mean friendship or loyalty, right? The dog probably means threat. So we have to be careful not to use things that are symbolic to us in going to be totally misunderstood by the rest of the world. That seems easy and self-explanatory, but it's not necessarily. I, um, I could absolutely stick a dog into my story as like a creepy element. You know, we also, the, the, the black dog is a totally opposite symbol, right? Um, the black dog is the symbol of death. Um, but I could put in, you know, like a Dalmatian. That's a happy dog, right? Um, I know I'm, I'm a mutt person. I have no idea what breeds are. Um, but you know, I can put a Dalmatian into my story. And, uh, for me, that means, you know, this is a, a tense environment and the person reading it is like, oh, everything's going to be okay. There's a happy Dalmatian puppy. So I guess the point of this is make sure you reread your stuff outside of yourself or have or ask if your symbols work for your editor your beta reader your friends who are reading your work um because you're not you're not going to know the things that are inside your head and not not universal um so that's that <laughs> um good good examples are um i as you know, I'm having some cat issues, and my bookmark is what I threw at my cat to get him to stop eating my painting. <laughs> uh, he's fine. I didn't hit him. Anyway, I found my pace, place in my book. Um, good symbolism is stuff that's subtle. I think it works much better as objects than uh, characters or places. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff out there if you are doing research on symbolism that says basically any noun can be a symbol, and I suppose that that's true, but if you have a person who's a symbol, um, you're going to have to do a lot of work. Um, and you have to accept that, like, people aren't, not everyone's going to understand it, you know? Um, having, having a character archetype where you're like, this, uh, child represents like the innocence of children or something i i don't know um sure but presumably that goes throughout your story it works with the arc of the plot or the or character development um i think that also feeds into that that stephen king quote that i said at the beginning that symbolism should not create an artificial sense of profundity um If you're working that hard on on making a character be a symbol then they can't possibly be much of a character uh they're not going to be particularly three-dimensional it's going to work into tropes i just this is all to defend my stance that it's better that you use objects uh, <laughs> um 
if yeah um, there's like I said there's a lot out there that says really any noun can be a symbol and I think that persons mm -hmm. and ideas as symbols are like, weird and dangerous territory um, I also have no idea how an idea can be a symbol but uh, that is a noun is a person place thing or idea um, place I can kind of understand you know um, but I also see place as a collection of things for instance, anytime, I'm going to go back to this Bible stuff, um, anytime we are in a garden, we've got a whole history of gardens that we're, that we're playing with. This is more on intertextuality, right? Every time we write something in a garden, we're interacting with every piece of literature, every piece of music, um, movies, whatever art comes before us. We're, we're talking to it. So if we're using an apple, we're interacting with everything that has an apple in it that came before us, even accidentally, even incidentally, um, even if we haven't read it. It's, there's just such a rife history of some symbols, like dogs, like gardens, like specific fruit. <laughs> I'm going to get off the apple trip, I swear. Uh, but I just, I think it's, a really easy example and I personally understand the simple better right I can expand from the simple into the bigger picture and that's why I like to to focus on the little and easy um, yeah so um, colors are also um, complicated. I think that they're great for adding symbolism, right? But you don't want to get into that um, that awkward space where we were all really annoyed with our high school English teachers for going on and on and on and on and on about what the green light meant in The Great Gatsby. I don't remember what my English teacher said. I didn't look it up in preparation for today because I don't think it's that important. I have reread Gatsby um, since high school, I think twice and just never thought the green was that important. Um, you know, I can, I can look into it now and say uh, green is a sign of safety. Green is a sign of nature. Right, green, <laughs> green means go. <laughs> um, but does it have that much effect on the story? Do you understand the point of the story without it? Um, Hopefully, you know, hopefully uh, whatever it is that your symbol is that you're using, you, your story can survive without it. But with the symbol, the story is enriched. It's, it's bigger, it's fuller. But your story should be able to survive without it. Because not everyone's going to pick up on, on, on the depth within these symbols. I hope that I am encouraging you to use symbols, just to use them well, rather than um, avoid them altogether. There is certainly something to be said for sparse writing, but that is not what we're talking about today. No, um, none, no, no minimalist writing today. We are we are hawthorning it up. Um, there are also symbols that we see in daily life, in um, holiday preparation. <laughs> um, my, my black cat uh, laid, laid down in a box. It was adorable. Um, but right, we see black cats in preparation for Halloween. So in, in the one way, if you have a visual medium, right, you may have like the arched back black cat and that tells your audience Halloween is coming. Um, but if you're writing a story in which a black cat crosses your path, perhaps bad luck is coming. Um, so that's not intertextuality, that's just context. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that we see in real life in, in advertising, in holiday prep. It's almost like I just said these words that, uh, that we all recognize and, and with advertising, it's su it's to such a, a crazy and explicit extent, right? If I if I'm not careful, you know, I might confuse a visual of the St. Louis Arch with the McDonald's arches. 
uh, <laughs> and that's not something that has a deep meaning, although it absolutely could if you're writing a story about like consumerism or or something. Um, and then then those can then the arch or the arches can have a really really great um, double meaning or depth to them. But uh, if I'm just writing a, a travel story and my character is on a road trip and passes a lot of McDonald's or drives through St. Louis, there's not a ton going on there. Except, you know, I don't have to say St. Louis if I say the arch. That's symbolism too. Um, obviously to a much less profound extent, but still symbolism, still important. Uh, any Anything we write, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, will have some element of this and I think that in revision, it's really fun and really important to look into what nouns we can replace with other nouns. I know that um, I did not plan to talk about my own writing today, so sorry, you're welcome. Um, but I know that there was a piece I wrote, I wrote the piece probably 10 years ago now. Um, hey, Katie! <laughs> that was exciting. Um, and five years after finishing the piece, you know, several edits in, I changed one word and it became wordplay at that point. The word had double meanings and I don't know what it was, so sorry. Uh, ask me later, I guess. <laughs> um, and I was so proud of it because it was something that, you know, didn't occur to me for five years. And that's another part of why revision is so, so great, so important, but also really fun. Um, you can play with your nouns. I guess that's my, my whole big point. Play with your nouns and see, you know, um, what, what you can do with your setting, for example. You know, you're, you're telling this, this story, you're, you're setting, your your world building, and this old lady has a bouquet in a vase on a table what kind of table and what kind of flowers can do a lot of heavy lifting for, for telling us about this old lady. Um, because flowers, like roses, right, um, have tons and tons of symbolism to them, just depending on, on the type of flower. And, you know, maybe the table too. Granted, um, maybe it's not so much symbolic as it is uh, character building when you say, you know, she had a, whatever, a round table, but it had a, like a doily, like a lace tablecloth on it. You know, how much heavy lifting does that do for character building? Without knowing, it was something her mother made for her while she was dying. Or whatever. Um, I think, personally, personally, I would leave symbolism for for revision because if if you're worried about productivity if you're worried about writing you need to get the writing out first and go back later and and add that depth then it's not um it's not something that you have to wait for later to do right if you've got a really great idea um or if uh, horror for example is so often just, um, <laughs> oh, Shishuen, you are killing me today. I love this. Um, Shishuen commented that she has a, a bouquet of flowers in a, in a vase on her table. So I think that we're all going to have to leave today and write about Shishuen's table. <laughs> um, horror is something that I really, really like to, to close read. Horror movies. Usually I don't read horror because I am a wimp and I get scared, but I have a lot of fun dissecting horror movies because they are all one symbol, one metaphor, and then you just um, rip into it like it's a, like it's a pinata of, of metaphor candy falling all over. Um, I should probably do a segment on horror for that reason, but it'll um, suck. Because I don't read horror, I'm too scared of it. <laughs> um, but that's the thing, you know. You can absolutely start where um, the the cornerstone of your piece is a symbol. Uh, that's 
that's also a great place for stories to come from. I was talking with um, Midwest Writing Center family member Skylar Alexander last night about uh, how much I love her many projects because she seems to start with these very specific and small ideas and it's from those small ideas that like it's just one teeny tiny detail like a like she just zooms in on something so so far that the rest of us would miss it and then she forms her projects her poems whatever it is that she's working on around this one detail and it's such rich content I don't know how many of you have um read her work but every time she tells me about a project I'm amazed by how she starts with this teeny tiny detail and that's where somehow within that symbol within the the teeny tiny detail um there's a universal there's just so much to expand from which is totally um something that I can talk about extensively later it's something that actually I've I've been thinking about a lot with um research and essay content so we will revisit that one but the point of course there is you can be me and add symbolism later or you can start with one great idea and build around one solid symbol uh, uh, uh intertextuality i have touched on it a little bit a lot of it throughout um the last 26 minutes but um i want to make sure i give it a, a good focus when you when you write as someone who also reads as someone who loves literature you are i'm gonna not say what you're expecting here <laughs> not not the thing i keep saying um you're interacting with the literature that you love um i i read a book called adverbs by daniel handler and it uh it rocked my world it changed the way i think about reading it changed the way i think about writing um, and it, it changed the way that I see symbols, though I didn't, I wouldn't have put those words to it at the time. Um, I, magpies feature heavily in this story. And, um, I, like, I have a magpie tattoo, largely inspired by this book. Um, but when I looked up the symbolism of magpies years later, um, because I was just thinking about how much I love this book, um, they did not mean what I thought they meant in um in myth and in you know fortune telling the places where we develop meanings for symbols you know you um in in fortune telling and in myth it tends to be that we get we get the symbolism from the animal's characteristics if it's an animal and so you know we talk about magpies are attracted to shiny things for example um or they are you know, fiercely protective. Um, but in this story, magpies definitely, story, it's a, it's a 200 page book. It's not short. Um, it's a collection of stories that talk to each other. It's a complicated book. I said it's the way I think about reading and writing because it was very weird. And one of my all time favorites. I do recommend it. But um, the magpies show up so often in, in love. It's a, all the stories are about love. They're about different kinds of love. They're not necessarily romantic, happy love stories, but they're about what love can be. And so the magpies show up a lot surrounding different kinds of love. So I was like, well, clearly magpies are about love. And I looked into the symbolism and that's not the case. Although I want to say they are monogamous, which is not important interesting um so the things that we love the the media that we take in and appreciate that sticks with us is going to change the way that we see symbols particularly the ones that feature heavily in the things that we love um and as such i think it is a great honor that we can respond to the works that we love um i uh you know i'm not going to have a character named you know young bad man white uh, <laughs> but um not because i think that that's crappy but um 
you know, if I do use magpies in a story, it's because I read this beautiful story that featured magpies, right? I never thought about magpies before that. Um, and, and the same goes for anything, for cellos, for, I'm gonna just keep saying nouns. <laughs> um, the same goes for anything. And color is complicated. I, I touched on that a little bit, but um, you can look into the psychology of colors if you want to um, be very careful about the colors you use. But, you know, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. <laughs> And that goes a lot for colors, you know, sometimes we're just describing someone's clothes and it does not matter that she wore blue versus red versus yellow. Um, but sometimes the green light does matter, sometimes the wallpaper being yellow matters. Um, which is, I guess, why you want someone to read your work, you want someone to talk to you and engage with you about um, what you may possibly be implying intentionally or not with the symbols that you use. Um, obviously there are things in real life that have symbolic value like a coat of arms or, um, well, roses. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, gosh, I'm not, not doing well on, on my examples right now. Um, and so, you know, you can use those things the, the really obvious ones that we see every day, and they can mean nothing, or you can add a lot of weight to them. Um, for instance, when you talk about a white picket fence, you may be talking about, right, the, the American dream and a nuclear family, but you may also be referencing, uh, I almost said Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer, and, and that's really fun, and you can lean into it in whatever way you want, just just to play with it. It doesn't have to be deeply symbolic. It can be, um, I keep looking this way because of, because of that. I apologize. Um, it doesn't have to be deeply symbolic. It can just be uh, in, in homage, in homage to, to the literature that you love. So probably if I were going to have a mad pie in my story, it would be a shout out to Daniel Handler and not something about magpies. Um, Another, uh, <laughs> another tattoo I have that I got from a symbol from a book, um, is coyotes. Coyotes, um, have a ton of just widely disparate, um, meaning symbolically, right? So, um, we, if you maybe are from, uh, somewhere rural, you, um, see them as a pest right? They're totally legal to kill and people are really upset that they're eating their chickens. Um, and once uh, white people got to this continent, the uh, the mythological value of coyotes changed too from um, a symbol of mankind to a trickster symbol, which is interesting. Um, but then if you look into, like I was saying before, the um, with when you use animals as symbols, um, the behavior of the animal, uh, they are, they are monogamous and they stay to a small territory and they have playdates with other families. Like they're, um, that's another animal that can have just widely varied meaning depending on how you want to use it. Um, obviously Anything can have some symbolism to it, and the trick is keeping out of that, uh, the false profundity. The word profundity is just ridiculous. I, I just want to say profound instead. Um, and you want to stay away from the false profundity and steer into the subtle depth, the little, the little tiny pieces of depth and enrichment it can add to your story. Um, I hope this was helpful to anybody interested in symbols. I would like to leave us now with our writing prompt of the day, which is going to be a symbol. Shocking, I know. And the symbol we are going to use today is a monarch butterfly. Um, in For me, the reason this is 
uh, interesting is because, you know, they're a species that we're trying to protect as humankind or in North America or whatever. <laughs> um, but also, so I can't find my timer on my phone. Um, you know, I remember seeing like in science, science class videos where we talk about, um, like the color red on an animal makes it so that predator species don't eat it. Um, because monarchs, in fact, are, are poisonous, but there are other butterflies out there that mimic the color to keep as like an evolutionary defense. Um, you know, butterflies can mean a lot of things. You can have butterflies in your stomachs, you can have in your stomachs. You have many of them. Um, or, you know, they can be delicate or they are um they persevere <laughs> uh, i just learned recently that they it takes three generations for them to migrate from mexico to canada and then just one to fly back like i'm i'm giving away all the secrets of the butterfly symbolism but we're doing monarch butterflies as our metaphor i'm putting five minutes on the clock if you're going to check out now i hope that you have a great day and as always write more light into your life drop us comments and questions and concerns as you um as you see fit. So, five minutes on the clock. Monarch butterflies. Okay, this is already reminding me because I definitely went to um, um, essay mode. Something that I really, really love about a really solid essay is that um, it often intertwines two concepts um, through, you know, deep research. But one of them, and this is just in the essays that I have found myself really loving, you know, we start out with a personal thing and then it goes into a bigger, a bigger picture for what I guess the essay is really about. Um, and one of those things is always deeply symbolic. So what I've, I've accidentally started into essay mode here by saying, um, you know, the, um, the monarch butterflies spend their lives on a survival mission, not for themselves, but for their species. Um, I mean, that's, that's ready. That's ready to become an essay, to become a, a metaphor for, you know, the survival of a species.
We have one minute left of the free write. That scared the crap out of me. Um, I may actually, I'm excited about this one. I may actually um, continue on with this essay about butterflies. <laughs> um, I hope that you got something out of that free write. I hope that, you know, if you're not done, you continue on writing in, in this vein. Um, as always, um, please let us know if there's any way that we can support you as um, as writers, as readers, as community members. Um, what resources might you need? What resources might you want? Um, questions you might have about reading, writing, existing in the world. As someone who engages with literature, let us know. Um, follow us on all the other social medias. Um, that's at MWC underscore QC on Twitter and Instagram. We have a YouTube channel, which um, I will link here in the comments because um, we need you to follow us so that we can have a personalized URL there. If you are already on YouTube and you don't know our Facebook is facebook.com slash Midwest Writing Center. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. On Thursday, um, I'm going to be here, yes, um, the, uh, the Thursday that none of you are working, so I expect you to be here with me. Um, I'm going to be here with Royce Barnett, Crunk Chocolate, of um, podcast and festival show fame, talking about arts in the Quad Cities. So, as always, write more light into your life. See you next time.